Seahawks fans, wherever you may be. Thanks for listening to the show. Join your hosts, Bill Alfstead and Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Hey, Seahawks fans, welcome back to another episode of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alfstead, sitting down with co-host Keith Myers, here to uh, catch you up on all the things, comings and goings for uh, Seahawks training camp. Uh, welcome in, Keith. Yeah, um, interesting uh, show today, I think. We've got uh, a lot of information from Pete Carroll after they had um, an off day and a couple practices in which he didn't speak. There were a lot of questions for him when he finally got back up to the podium and uh, got some really nice info from him. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested to get your thoughts on a couple of those pieces. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I thought that that, that interview uh, was was really intriguing. Um, lots of information. I think we got updates uh, about the running back situation, a couple other injury things, um, his observations uh, on, on some of the on-the-field things. Um, yeah, it was, it was fun overall. What did you think stood out? Uh, the running back stuff really stood out to me. <clears throat> I mean, you've got um, them saying that Ken Walker's got a um, really minor groin injury, but because it's groin, they're going to like hold him out and make sure he's a hundred percent before they let him on the field. Cause they don't want those things to linger. Um, that Charbonnet has um, a shoulder injury that he didn't have details on because they mm -hmm. were he was still waiting the, on those but he seemed a little bit concerned but then that that the other two guys the, the two backups have both been um standouts um so uh, yeah just very uh, interesting and kind of um revealing statements there about the running back room where it sounds like he believes they're they're, they're four deep not just two deep uh, yeah. at that spot. And that's become apparent too in practices. I mean, we, we saw that with the um, kind of the standout play of Kenny McIntosh. And I will say this too, uh, Pete made it, uh, uh, made us aware that DJ Dallas has also added 10 pounds um, of, of muscle and he's bulked up a little bit, hopefully hasn't lost too much uh, as far as speed, but it sounds like they want him to be, re be ready to, um, you know, kind of be a bell cow type back if necessary um should one of the two uh lead backs uh go out and currently right now in practice that's exactly what's going on so he's getting plenty of reps with the mm -hmm. ones and then kenny mcintosh i guess <clears throat> has conversely lost 10 pounds from his uh off-season workouts and so forth so he's come in very uh refined sleek whatever you want to uh, call it but uh showing his speed and agility which didn't test really well for him in the off That's season. Why he it dropped. Makes, well, ten pounds is not a lot when you only when you start out at two hundred five. I mean, you go to one ninety five or whatever. That still shouldn't slow him down per se. I, it seems to me, based on just observations and what everyone is saying about him and watching him on tape in practices, is that maybe there was something going on. Um, during the combine time, during the pro days where he just wasn't on his game, whether it was a little uh, knee thing or an ankle thing or some, you know, a, a, a slight muscle pull or, or something there because everything else shows up on tape. You go back to Georgia, you watch him there. Um, he's moving around very, very quick. He's not running away from defenders um, like Ken Walker can, but he, but he also isn't the slowest guy in the room either, like a, a four six two. Now Pete did say, did mention four six two uh, in that press conference, and and but he dismissed it immediately and just went, you know, he's got all the agility and quickness that we need, um, and I so I find that really interesting, and I I wouldn't mind hearing it from the horse's mouth at some point out of McIntosh, if there was something there in in the spring um, that that's now resolved and you know, he's back to normal. So, yeah. I mean, what I, um, what I see is a guy that plays fast. Um, there's no slow plotting, uh, aspect to his game. When you watch him out there, he's quick, he's explosive. Um, and so, I mean, mostly padless practices so far, so we'll see what happens, but I, I don't see a guy that's slow. Um, in practice. So yeah, was he injured? Was there something else going on? Maybe he's just a guy that, um, and 
who just doesn't like those kind of drills and and doesn't uh, his body doesn't react to him, but on the football field, he, he's he just plays stronger and whatnot. Um, yeah, so we've got a, um, you know, he he if he's if he is a more athletic than we thought coming out of the draft, that's a great sign for him. Yeah, um, and it puts and him I in actually, the third or fourth round range where I think I yeah, you know I personally had is, him prior to the draft. Yeah, I mean that's where I thought he was going to be, but then his testing numbers were so bad. He, I was like, well, he may not get drafted, and then he was a seventh rounder. Um, so yeah, I mean it was that's just kind of where he was at. But his tape was be- much better than his testing numbers suggested it should be, and so um, now he's starting to show on the practice field that his tape was was. Um, not misleading. So that's a great spot for the Seahawks to be in. Um, and the DJ Dallas thing with him being up at 230 is 230, interesting. 230, right? He's the guy who's listed as 214. Yes, um, yes, yes. So he's 16 pounds up from uh, where he was when he was drafted. Um, yeah, yeah. He is not, he does not look fat or out of shape. He's just big. Um, and I can actually see him better in that role because he's certainly not explosive you never you never uh you know talk about dj dallas and you use the word explosive um you know he's a fine running back he's uh he's not dynamic and so and even in his kick returns and so forth he's 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 good he can make that slash make that cut but he's not just super 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 talented um you know i and i say that with a grain of salt obviously he's more talented than probably uh no less than ninety eight point nine percent of all running backs that ever have existed, um, but um, for this team, he's been average for us. Uh, no one's going to confuse uh, him with Ken Walker. Yeah, well, until he broke out a little bit last year at the end of the year, we were kind of like, well, you know, we can upgrade that for sure, and I and we did. We kind of addressed that, um, but he's still a steady player, consummate pro, uh, and they're getting their opportunity now. You know, Mm -hmm. let's talk about the guys up top, though. That's a little concerning for me. Not overly concerning, but I want to talk about it. Ken Walker with a groin. Um, I think it's precautionary. It sounds like he he, I think he's, you know, if push came to shove on game day, he'd probably go out there and and line up. Uh, So the team's taking a slow roll uh, on keeping him healthy. Uh, so he's ready for day one. I don't mind that. He doesn't have anything to prove. It'd be nice for him to kind of get in sync with his blockers and linemen and so forth in, in camp. And I would imagine he's probably a week away. Pete indicated that there was no timeline, but he also didn't indicate that it was going to be a long-term issue. Um, and then Charbonnet, you know, all indications, if that's the case, he didn't hurt it on the, on a, on an, on the field move or whatever. It seems like it might be a weight uh, training issue. Um, or, or something like that where he maybe just tweaked a muscle and uh, something like that sometimes takes up to two, three weeks to resolve. Uh, hopefully it's not that long with Charbonnet or it's not more serious. I haven't heard yeah. any word yet. This was yesterday. We're recording on Tuesday morning right now. So that came out yesterday uh, that there was that issue and, um, and, and he was going through all the testing and so forth, and we just haven't heard a word yet. Yeah, we haven't heard. Um, and usually, I mean, uh, if it had been bad, then you'd have seen uh, Schefter or someone uh, break it saying he's got a torn shoulder or whatever. Um, the fact that we heard nothing, I think, is good um, is good news. So um, we'll see. Okay. Uh, but it, it does give, it does give um, Dallas and uh, McIntosh a shot to really get a lot of reps. Um and that's good for them. The Seahawks signed a um, camp body at the position just to help out to make sure the defenders can get a couple of them. their reps in. So yeah, they they uh, signed a guy by the name of uh, Sard- Sardoric Thompson and Wayne uh, Tua La Papa, uh, p- uh, past running back from the University of Washington, actually, to come in and take snaps. Yep. So um, and and they signed a couple other guys too. Um, Roderick Perry uh, is a defensive tackle. Um, who else did they sign? Looking, looking, looking. I think it was Andrew Whitaker at cornerback, potentially. 
Um, so anyway, they, they have a couple guys that they, they've brought in. Liam uh, Ryan at tackle as well was signed uh, yesterday afternoon uh, late. Um, anything else out of that press conference? You know, it was interesting. It was hard to hear him, uh, first of all. Uh, not Pete, but the questions. And mm-hmm. so sometimes he was kind of talking in general terms. And he really didn't know what the question was. Um, but uh, if anybody's out there and, and can go to Seahawks.com and just look at his interview from, from yesterday, uh, it was it was kind of cool. It, it it's it is nice because Pete Carroll is one of those guys that he's he he kind of dances around sometimes, but other times he's very specific, and um, depending on the question. So you got to you, know, you you do have to learn to translate Pete though, um, <laughs> because yeah. there are the there are words and phrases that he used that mean a specific thing to him that don't necessarily um, jive to you know normal. Uh, English um, for the rest of us, but they're very, they're Pete-isms. And so you kind of got to have to get used to that a little bit. Um, if he ever describes an in- injury as legit, just the guy's that's, going on IR and thing. may never yeah. play again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, that is proven to be true over time. Okay, so um, what about the pads coming on uh, for the first practice uh, on Monday? Um, general observations, and uh, let's talk about some players. So Jerron Reed um, appears to be the starter at nose tackle. Like the whole, um, you know, that uh, he was going to be the three tech and slide inside occasionally um, in order mm-hmm. to provide a rotation. Now he's the starter at nose, um, which is interesting because now it, it opens up that question on who's the three tech, who's the starter on the second defensive end spot. Um, there's an opening mm-hmm. there. There's some opportunity there and we'll see what happens with that. But um, yeah, he's definitely um, the starter at nose. Um, Pete was talking about, you know, that and that at 310, he's, he's fine that he's played it a lot and that, um, and he's getting the reps with all the ones, um, you know, so and, that, and yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So that, that's set up like, so yeah. now so how do you feel about that? It. You know, I think he's a little undersized for that, he's but at the same time, right now, three ten. I heard yesterday. Yep. Um, he's like I said, he's a little undersized for that because you you typically want your nose tackle to be three thirty. Um, that's just you know kind of the the stereotype for for that because of their ability to just not be moved and require a double team to move um, in the running game and that kind of stuff. Um, so he's a little undersized, but he's quick and for that size. That's the reason why he's had all those sacks in his career. Um, and so he's more of a of a penetrator than a space eater. Um, so it tells me that their uh, scheme might be more one gappy and less two gappy for a three four, which there's different ways to run a three four. And is there? Yeah, there really are. Um, because you can run the three four. I mean, you know that Pete is innovative and he's kind of multiple that way. And and um, yes. Yes, but I've always understood this thing, especially the Vic Fangio I, I, iteration of this defense, which apparently is what we're running. I, I, that's the only one I've mm-hmm. heard about. Yeah. Um, th- that defense is predicated on having a monster um, a zero or one tech um, defensive tackle that weighs like 335 pounds. Like, what What am I not getting? I think what you're what's happening is – they want they're running that they're that they're, they're basing that but then they're tweaking that um whether it's t- tweaking it to their um the talent on the roster or tweaking it to try and evolve it um but they definitely seem to be tweaking it um and then you look back to last year where they they kind of alternated between two different systems At some games they two gapped up front um <clears throat> for those people that um don't know what that means is that it has to do with uh, what you're asking your lineman to do. So um, two gapping means you stack the guy in front of you, you square their shoulders and you push them back if you can. And then you, you read the running back and you either shed the block right or left and, and slide into the gap, but you, you can, can <clears throat> you can control two gaps that way. Um, <clears throat> one gap means that you just you have a spot where you're supposed to go and your job is to penetrate into that gap and be as disruptive as possible. Um, for chunks of the season, the front two gapped quite a bit. And in other chunks of the season, um, they they didn't two gap at all. Um, and so 
and it was frustrating because the, uh, the defense was significantly more effective when they were one gapping. It's a, um, no, yeah, and aggressive. Yeah. So, and in fact, um, we heard Puna Ford complain about that in a in an interview uh, in the New York Jets camp about he's looking forward to, to to playing in a defense that that can turn him loose and, and be more aggressive. And um, so, yeah, I was, in fact, I was going to ask you about that. Just like, yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's that's um, that tells you quite a bit about you know, um, you know what Puna Ford like was thinking about what was going on and 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 all of that where they were asking him to not be aggressive to stack the um the no, the center or guard in front of him um wait and then shed the Brand. block for for yeah. a tackle where you're not uh John Reed is not that guy he's not he's quick he's a penetrator um and if you are signing him to a multi-year deal to be your starter at nose tackle it to me that says you are committed to the one gap version of this so are um, we going to actually see more four three personnel on the field at the same time then, or are we still looking at a three four front or bare front? You're still looking at a bare front, um, and uh, <clears throat> so what you'll have though is instead of three four, it's more like a five two, um, because your outside linebackers um, take a step forward. They're not they don't have a hand on the ground, but they're essentially your edges outside both tackles. Um, and so you end up with it's, it's like I said, it's essentially a five two. Um, and you might have a, uh, you might have a third safety on the field more often than in that scenario. Yes, um, just a more athletic guy to be able to come up and play uh, in the box somewhere. True, but with Seattle's corners, the the three that they've got are all big, physical. Well, I guess Witherspoon's true. not maybe not big, but he's definitely physical. Uh, yeah. But the three guys that you've got are 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 guys that are physical and tackle well. So you may not need to have a safety um, because Mike Jackson. Um, well, I was only in thinking like in, safety. in terms of our uh, off the ball linebacker depth and, yeah. and they may choose to, to have a safety in there. Okay. So yeah, I wanted a, to get have back. a nickel. So, okay. Um, yep. So, so we've decided that Jaron Reed is going to be the, the starting nose tackle. He's going to be in a rotation with possibly miles Adams, Cameron young for sure. Um, let's talk about that defensive end spot that you mentioned. I hadn't really mm-hmm. thought about that. If Jerron Reed's in there, he takes him out of that box, puts him in another category. Now that competition has kind of opened up, you said. So we've got Dre Jones on one side. That's a, that's a given. We've also got in camp Mario Jones Jr., who's been with five teams, more of a run uh, edge, edge setter kind of guy, not really going to penetrate for you, get any tackles for loss or – um, pressures, and no, then Mike LJ, Morris, the new LJ Carl, he's LJ Collier, two point right? He's a guy that is strong, bull rushes, but you know he's only going to bull rush so many, it's like so effectively throughout a, a game, um, but isn't moved easy, and therefore plays the run well, um, and so and that's kind of that's who Mario Williams is. Um, that and then you've got Mike like Morris, starter. and then you've got Miles Adams. Mm-hmm. Essentially, I mean, you've got MJ Anderson and Jacob uh, uh, Sykes in camp. Um, those just seemingly at this point are camp bodies. Let's focus on Mike Morris, Miles Adams, and Mario Edwards for that spot and talk about the rotation potentially. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> to me, that that actually is a position there where I am not all that comfortable because um, I don't see... I mean, Mike Morris is a rookie and a guy that that you want to develop into a starter. And and there's there's at this point, you know, reason to be optimistic about him. But um, yes, you know, I, but that's I, it he, right now. You know, he was a lower lower draft pick for Heard a reason. good things so far in camp. By the way, just putting it out there. But you're right; he hasn't played it down. Yep, and so we'll you know um, the depth isn't that great. I mean, we saw um, Miles Adams last year. When he got a chance and came in, it was incredibly ineffective. Um, Apparently, and... he's being uh, he's he's well thought of. A, B, uh, I've heard good things about him in camp. Turn, you know, he's showed up. He, he's gone through the, on another off season program. Pete Carroll singled him out as well as having um, a, a good day the other day. Um, yeah, and and so I want to talk about Mario Edwards Jr. a little bit. 
Okay. Um, in the spring after the draft, we we signed Mario Edwards to to come in and kind of be part of a rotation. But he was kind of an afterthought. Still is. Most people aren't talking about him. But Pete Carroll mentioned him um, specifically about, uh, hey, don't discount Mario Edwards. Uh, here's a guy coming in. He's gonna he's gonna be an important player for us. He's gonna be part of a rotation. I mean, th- th- that wasn't the quote, but that's essentially what Pete said. Are we discounting that player? Um, knowing what Pete knew when he knew it, he knew he was gonna have Jerron Reed play nose tackle. We didn't all know that. He didn't. They didn't say that. He knew it though, and he talked about Mario Edwards as being being the guy. If I had to bet money, just based on that information, I would think Mario Edwards would start. Yeah, I mean, it does kind of put that on there. But show me, I, other than the fact that he was a first round draft pick, you go look at his career and show me the starter in there. You know, the, the league does not value edge setters at five tech. They just don't. Yeah. It's because they're. they're there's a lot of them, and if you only do one trick really well, um, it better be rushing the passer. You're going to be only... like a, a back end rotation, back end of the roster kind of guy in the NFL because that's why I think I'm, I'm high on Mike Morris because um, if if he turns out the way that everyone thinks he's going to turn out, um, he could end up being that difference maker there. Now I'm not talking the first week in, in September. But by the midseason role, um, he could be an important component to this defense. Just because yeah. he, he, he gives you a little bit more there. He, he can mm-hmm. defend the run, but you don't have to take him off the field on passing downs. You could kind of yeah. leave him in there if you wanted to, you know, uh, and especially if you've got uh, Noasu or Taylor right on his back pocket. Um, it seems like that might be a nice little opportunity for him. Agreed. And, um, but again, I'm just going to say like, there's, there's a lot of if, and hopefully in that, um, for, a for a rookie and I'm want this team to be, um, you know, Super Bowl competitive. Uh, we think the offense is going to be that because it looks really explosive. Um, can the defense match? And I don't know if at this point, like I feel great about that, um, you know, that spot, um, you know, opposite uh, Dre Jones um, at defensive end. I mean, it's, it's just, funny. We just traded concerns from uh, nose tackle defensive, defensive tackle. end. Right. Yeah. yeah, essentially. So we're still short, I think, a, a, a kind of a, a starter level player that could come in and play, uh, hold down that spot. and But that gives them options, too. Uh, especially in like the the cut down uh, opportunities that come at the mm-hmm. end of August, um, you know, and that's just a couple of weeks away, really. And then, um, you know, in season trades potentially, if we just don't think there's, we've we've got a, a couple places you can always move Jerron Reed back out a little bit and, and get a nose tackle if that's what's available. You can also do that base defensive end. There's a ton of them. You know, everyone that can play in a four three can also play in a three four at that spot. I think at least as a three tech, um, situationally. Okay. So let's move off this topic and let's talk about some players. We've had two practices since we met last, uh, the, the fourth practice and then the fifth practice and the fifth practice was with pads. Um, and I'm hearing that the defense, um, really showed up. Yeah, they're going to, uh, <laughs> Um, first day of pads, the defense is going to take a huge step forward um, because when you don't have pads, the def- it's mainly the defensive players that are severely limited, right? Yeah. They can't. And they, they're, they're missing things and they they look bad and they're getting beat. Yeah, because they can't be physical. They can't right. do. They can't actually use a lot of the techniques that they use to be good at their job now that the pads are on now that contact is allowed now that um, things are more physical um the defense is going to start showing up and um so yeah that's that's highly expected and then the offense will adjust because you know after days and days of being able to run free with no contact now suddenly they're being contacted and it'll take them a day or so to to um you know adapt and get back to doing what they do um 
but yeah, so it's, it is interesting. It's, um, yeah, well, you know, from all accounts, the energy was way up. Uh, the battles were, were a little bit more intense. You saw some offensive line, defensive line, um, things that, that we haven't seen yet in practice. Um, guys like Phil Haynes are, are starting now to, to kind of show he, he's already kind of shown up in camp. Uh, I, I keep hearing his name. I haven't heard Anthony Bradford's name yet, Keith, out of anybody. But I keep hearing about Phil Haynes, and Phil Haynes is excited to take th this opportunity. And there's been a few articles written just on Phil Haynes, um, so that so that's interesting to me. The other thing that I I find interesting, okay, so Witherspoon's been through a couple of practices. He hasn't yet shown completely that he's ready for prime time. It's early. He's playing a new position that he's not completely familiar with in a new defense. Uh, so we're going to give him the benefit of the doubt there. But I keep hearing about. Um, in Jigba, his name just keeps coming up like Jigba, every day. He's having, he's Mike got Jackson. to play. He's yep. beaten some of our best corners one on one guys that are proven in the NFL press corners. Uh, he, he's, he's making them look silly. And, um, that's, that's a great sign for this offense. I mean, it's not, it's, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm going to discount that a little bit on our defensive side because we're still kind of figuring that out. Um, but it's super Rick, exciting for for Rick to be not added there. to this, yeah. Um, and uh, Witherspoon isn't, which is funny because that Pete just called him Spoon. Um, just to throw that out there, yeah. Um, uh, let's, Witherspoon's let's <laughs> not um, uh, not up to speed yet, so there, there's a little bit of that. But um, at the same time, like, yeah, he looks quick, he looks fast. He's he has clearly studied because he, he's not making. A lot of mistakes um and just looks exceptional uh and and pete commented on that too and just saying that he's he's just there and he expects him to have a major impact and role um on everything this team does so um yeah he's looked really good but you're right like his name keeps coming up and mike jackson's name keeps coming up like those are the two guys that i hear the most about uh day in and day out so yeah yeah interesting. Ja you know, Pete singled uh, um, Jackson out again in his press conference and said that the guy just keeps showing up um, mm -hmm. and, and really um, it's a good uh, opportunity for this for this defense to have him there. He looks like the starter, and it's only been four or five practices. Um, Trey Brown, though, is, is practicing really well. He's had some good battles, especially with Tyler Lockett and some others. Uh, he's had his share of wins, but he's also been beat as well. I think that's what you're going to get out of Trey Brown. He doesn't have tremendous recovery speed, so anything anybody that's going to be on him that's um, quick and fast might be might be some trouble. I'm 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 kind of projecting there a little bit, but um, that's kind of what I'm sensing so far. Um, Kobe Bryant again. I think all of our corners in camp so far have really you know been tested and have won battles but they've also lost some things and i mm -hmm. and, and I, you got to take that with a grain of salt a it's camp b our receivers are so good i mean it's just one of those things where it's and, like and until you're going against dk no metcalf and, you're going against dk metcalf and tyler lockett and now in jigba it's like pick one and and those guys could go win a game for you um so i mean it's an uphill battle for these corners but uh, let's talk about Bobby Wagner. Bobby Wagner looks like the guy that we've always known. In fact, I heard Bob Condotta he say that he faster. looks as fast as he did three years ago. That's what the part that that's the part that that's really kind of amazed me is he looks faster now than he did last year or the year before. Um, Thirty three years old, coming up on his twelfth season in the yeah. NFL. Pete joked that maybe he's getting faster as he gets older. Um, <laughs> And I don't know. I don't know if it's because remember he's also got that knee that's been bothering him for yeah. eight years now. Um, that he usually has some sort of injection uh, in it with, um, you know, a week or two weeks before the season. He has to sit out a week and then comes back and and is ready for week one. Um, that's been his his thing for like five years in a row now. Um, <clears throat> if that knee is not giving him the problems it usually gives him, because uh, maybe he you know, took care of this before he showed up. Yeah, advancements in treatment and whatnot have, have given him some. Well, okay, well, he may have gotten some of that speed back that he'd lost the last few years. And if that's true, 
then you're getting vintage Bobby Wagner. And that's yeah. scary if you're another team because he was good when he was when he was slowed. Now he's going to be back he can, to He can just be instinctual and, and fast. Yeah. You know, uh, on Sunday, so it would have been the fourth practice, um, Wagner had several highlighted plays, uh, one, uh, two plays back-to-back, -back, one in which he was running downfield stride for stride with DJ Dallas, 40 uh, yards down the field, broke up a pass. Next play, uh, Seahawks ran a reverse with DK Metcalf, and he prevented DK Med Metcalf from turning the corner. So talk about two polar opposite plays that he has to diagnose at the line of scrimmage. And so you're not getting a jump on, on, on these things. This is just a natural uh, ability to react and mm -hmm. get to where you need to be. And that's great news. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, who? Why don't you give me a couple players to talk about? Um, well, you mentioned Kobe Bryant. And there was one thing that I wanted to mention about him that I've noticed. Um, he's been lining up at free safety. Have you noticed that? I heard that he played a little bit of safety, but I, I didn't get what a little bit meant. Yeah, he um, he's lined up. I mean, he's mostly playing uh, corner, mostly playing slot corner, but I think it's because of the fact that you've got guys like Julian Love and uh, Jarek Reed that are both free safety or safety slash slot corner guys um, that they're asking... Um, Kobe Bryant, who's the other slot corner, to also do the the safety thing, so that just right. to and be yeah. more multiple, so that way um, they don't it doesn't they can do what they want to do regardless of who's on the field of those three, um, and so having him be able to to shift his responsibilities into a safety spot, um, I thought was really interesting. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, and, of, and you know the, the longer that the, the Kobe Bryant is around, it looks like that's going to be his career path, at least with this defense with the Seahawks. Um, he came in to the league having uh, played in the outside almost exclusively in college, was very good at it, won the Jim Thorpe Award as the best cover corner or, or cornerback in college football theory that, that he came out. Now he's being asked to play inside, uh, showing his uh, shiftiness, his uh, change of, of direction, agility. Um, and, and how sticky he can be. And he is a good sticky kind of quarter, uh, cornerback. I think he just needed a little bit of time to adjust to the NFL. It was a new position for him last year. Uh, he kind of struggled early, but then really came on, made a huge impact on forced fumbles. Yeah, I think he had four on, this, on the year, some pass breakups. Um, really, I think that time that he had in the defense um, taking snaps last year will, will pay dividends. If he can beat out some of the guys that are perceived to be in front of him right now, I mean, that that cornerback room is is tough, especially if Trey Brown is it, it beats him out, um, and then you've got Witherspoon now um, taking his his snaps at at the nickel, and then you've got a guy like Julian Love who's gonna who's really diverse for you. If you take a look at all the snaps that Julian Love had. For the Giants last year, he was all over the place. He took snaps mm -hmm. from like five different positions. So, so when you add all that up, where's Kobe Bryant going to fit in this defense? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, and that's this is a guy that that was the third corner on the team and played a significant role um, as that. And now he's looking at, you know, having to move around and play more special teams and it, the the talent above him on the depth chart has gotten better. So. Yeah. Interesting. How about another name? Um, how about Ben Burkhoven? Um Good story. I mean, the, when they, I didn't realize how bad it was when he tore up his knee um, two years ago. Um, but in training camp, because it was not just tore up his knee there was nerve damage. He couldn't lift his toes up. Like he couldn't lift his foot. He couldn't um, flex that shin muscle uh, anymore because of that. Um, he had three surgeries, one to, re uh, to repair the ACL, but two later on to, uh, to help that nerve. Yep. And now he's back out there playing and looking quick. Uh, he's always been quick. I mean, that's the thing. He's always been fast. He's just been undersized. Um, and you know, enough 
form hasn't been great, but he's he looks quick and given the extent of that knee damage. I love that he looks quick. That's such a good story for him. That's that's a huge testament right there. That that's really an important and and pr- probably the key component of his return is that he's fearless and he's able to physically uh, be the player that he was. Now that doesn't guarantee him a, a spot on this roster. He's got to go through a few other guys. There's going to be some decisions down the line where you're going to have good players that are going to be cut um, on this team. And um, but Ben Burkhoven, as we know, when healthy, was an excellent special teams guy. He wasn't going to give you much on the field. And quite frankly, I don't see that being uh, changing. But Mm -hmm. he could be one of your best special teams players, taking 75% of special team snaps just because he's so diverse. He's so uh, instinctual and quick um, and big enough at 225 pounds where he can kind of thump you. Um, That's a that's that'll be an interesting conversation as we get towards that cut down day, Keith. Well, one of the things <clears throat> that I looked at with when they resigned him that made me question it is where does he fit if he is going to be a linebacker and not just a special teams ace? Um, where does he fit? Because he's not an and uh, it he's not could come a, down to Nick Belor or Ben Brickervin. Yeah, I mean that's what I mean. It has to come in, and Belor's got some guaranteed money in his contract and his mm-hmm. team captain. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, because he's not an he's not an off the ball inside linebacker, and he isn't the edge rusher that you want in an outside linebacker. He when he was um, signed and, and made a name for himself, this was still a four three defense, and he could be your weak side linebacker. Um, yeah, uh, you know, somewhere and, and on the depth. Frankly, chart. we just talked about Vi Jones the other day. Vi Jones could also do both. He's got experience playing out on the outside as well. He's bulked up this year to play on the inside, but. If you want a scheme diverse linebacker, he'd be the guy that I would choose over Ben Burkirvan or yeah, he, he any, can anybody do else. Both. Yeah. Um, whereas Ben Burkirvan doesn't fit either. Now um, that we've fit, talked about this, he, he fits a different team. <laughs> different. Yeah. Different, now that now that we've team. talked about this, you can almost guarantee the the idea that if, if they like him and they do, they've proven that they've stuck with him. They they cut him in this spring because it just wasn't quite ready. Gave him an injury designation. They brought him back. He's in camp. It seems to me like he'd be a perfect player for the practice squad. A guy that's a proven vet. He's he's gotten enough uh, reps on the field and in special teams over time that if you can put him on on the practice squad, have him be available uh, on certain weeks where you believe that you he could be a value. Um, that seems like where he's going to land. Yeah, uh, I, he really does. Or. Um, I'd love to see them get him to a four three defense where he has a chance to um be more than that. You know what I mean? Whether it be a trade or whether it be a someone else claimed him off waivers, um, someone that runs a four three that can have him as their backup will and um and a special team ace and just give him personally a opportunity at uh, a, a bigger role on a team and a, and a, um, a longer career. Um, I'd love to see that for him, especially given everything he's had to go through to get back on the field at all. There's a lot of players I'd love to talk about. There's, but there's one situation that I, I mentioned to you. I, th- I think I sent you a screenshot on that. I want to get your take on is that at uh, offensive right guard. Yes. Uh, uh, Damian Lewis was out sick. The other day, I think it was Sunday. Mm-hmm. He's back now, no problem. But here's what the team did: they brought in Jake Curhan to be the uh, take first team reps at right guard, and they moved Phil Haynes over to left guard. Is that correct, or, or is yes. it the opposite? No, nope, and they exactly moved Phil Haynes over to left guard, and then Anthony Bradford still taking second team. That means essentially Anthony Bradford is viewed currently today as the third string right guard on this team. Maybe. Here's my, my thought on that. And um, actually I would say you're probably right, but there is another potential explanation. It was an Oluwatimi day at center. And if they are wanting, you know, as far as the communication and, and all of those things, um, to really help the kid 
you know, use this time to make as much improvement as possible. They want to put him next to a vet, whether it be Haynes, whether it be Curhan, but it's not Bradford, at least not at this early po- uh, point in camp. It is possible, and I don't know that or not, that that had to do with the the thinking there was that it got it kept Oluwatimi in um, next to a vet. Now, if it had been Evan Brown. If it had been an Evan Brown day at center, um, would they have? Uh, why didn't Evan Brown take that spot at right guard? What? Why? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, is there any positives that come out of this? I think it's all positive. Um, in that, so talk to me about that. Talk, talk to me about Kerhan. Kerhan is—he's a big guy. He's probably a little taller than ideal for a. A guard, but he's a he is you know he's a right tackle only with no left tackle like potential because he doesn't move well enough for that. But he's so powerful as a blocker. Um, he's a little tall for ideally for a guard, maybe not quick enough to be um, a, a, a tackle unless you're going to commit to putting a tight end there to help him. Um, but he, god damn, he's a powerful run blocker and. If you're needing a right guard, especially a backup right guard, um, who can also play tackle and give you all its flexibility on game day, um, you could do there's worse. far worse. There's yeah. far worse. Um, so and talk I to like me him ab- at guard. I like so him talk at guard. Talk to me so. about Anthony Bradford. What's going on? Um, I think it's just a matter of, of um, you know, he's just not picking things up as quick. The zone blocking scheme that um, Seattle and other teams run is not an easy learn for um for the offensive linemen especially the guards guards more than anyone um in that your you don't necessarily have a defined job pre-snap you have if this happens this is your job and if b happens then z is your job and if c happens then q is your job and you have to be able to make all of those reads and all of those decisions in real time and it takes um, it takes some time, and I think it's one of those things where, um, having not come from a zone blocking scheme in college, he's not as adapting as fast as as everyone would like. Uh, that doesn't mean he's not going to get there. It just means it's going to take him some time to. He's going to learn. He's got learning to do. He's a rookie. It happens. So I'll mention one more player, um, Abe Lucas. I just want to call him out because we haven't really talked about Charles Cross or Abe Lucas in camp so far. Um, usually that's an indication that things are going well and, and there's a certain expectation level of those players. Mm-hmm. And if they're doing their jobs, you're not going to hear much about them. But we'd much rather talk about some of the guys we're not familiar with uh, that we want to get to know. Uh, but Abe Lucas uh, yesterday in, in camp, in practice, uh, held his own uh, against... Our, our, our best pass rushers um, basically can just kind of stonewalled them and, and kept them out of the uh, the backfield uh, as far as pressures were concerned. He, you know, and he went against uh, Dre Jones uh, occasionally, Uchenna uh, uh, Nwasu, uh, Daryl Taylor, Boy Mafe. Boy Mafe apparently had a, a good practice yesterday as well. Um, and so I just wanted to say that, that yeah, uh, um, it's good to see Abe Lucas show up. It is. It's great to see. Um, I think it was, a, it was one of the... Um, um, Phil Haynes articles. He was talking about how uh, having to line up in practice against um, Dre Jones and Jerron Reed is going to make the uh, interior better because those are some of the more explosive pass rushing interior guys in the NFL. He's like, it is really hard to line up in practice against those guys. Um, you know, every snap. And um, I found that that comment to be interesting because he because Haynes has been doing well on that. He's not that wasn't an excuse to explain. Oh, this is why I keep getting beat. Um, it, he was just talking about how it's 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 a good thing. Um, and that when you're talking about Abe Lucas with that, it made me think of that right because he's lining up against um, everyone from you know bigger, powerful guys like like Dre Jones to fast, speedy guys. Um, like Uchenna Nuasu, and he's stonewalling them both. Yes. That's fascinating to me. 
Yeah. So on the on the other side, and I'll just mention this quick, and we'll get out of here. Um, last year, there were only two teams that allowed more yards than the Seahawks on the ground: the Texans yeah. and the Bears. Both awful teams, awful, awful defenses. Teams. Right. Well, we got to put Seattle in that category as well. We were awful against uh, defending the run. Mm-hmm. Um, how are we supposed to see any indications in camp? Um, other than, than in the games, that we're better or will be better or have an opportunity to be better at stopping the run this year. As given the idea that you mentioned right at the top that Jerron Reed is the starting nose tackle and he's going to be on the field and if on first and second, potentially third down. Getting kind of worn down, they're going to rotate Cameron Young in there eventually, I would imagine. Um, do we have enough? Have we done enough to effectively address that issue? here's if you want to see whether the team is going to be better and when you're watching these drills on the running plays um watch bobby wagner and devin bush and vi jones if they are able to flow to the ball and get to the running back um without being hit by an offensive lineman then they'll be better if they're fighting through offensive linemen to get to the ball, they won't. Because that's what that's what killed them last year, was that this team could not keep Jordan Brooks and um, um, yes. well, he's not on the team anymore, so the name I won't, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. you, they could not keep those guys clean at all, ever. They were always fighting through blocks to get to the football. And, um, yeah, being, you know, leading the league or being top five with it in two different players in tackles is, it, it looks great on paper, but there's something inherently wrong there because, mm-hmm. you know, we, it, and you go look at the stats on the, on the front line, uh, those guys, are, their, their tackles or tackles for loss or so forth were below league average. Yeah. Um, and that's a problem. Yeah. Um, now the good news is Jerron Reed is a good run tackler. Um, so is yeah. Dre Jones. Two guys we added in the off season. Mario Edwards is known for being a guy that can 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 set the edge and tackle uh, effectively. Mike Morris has been a good tackler. Miles Adams. Eh. No, he's uh, not. you know I'm I'm not personally excited about Miles Adams. Now, Miles when you go Adams listen to the year, the coaches, they the love run, Miles Adams. Against the run last year, Miles Adams was awful. Did you see the interview that he gave no. or the quotes? So he was talking about the run fits and, and last year, why we were ineffective last year. And he just mentioned the idea that it wasn't scheme. It was the the players and it was trust and players, you know, all 11 people doing what they're supposed to do on defense and having that done effectively. And he said that was an issue. Um, and he, he mentioned it a couple different times in a couple different ways. He didn't throw anybody under the bus, but I'm wondering if he was part of that problem. Now we we talked about um, Puna Ford. I know I'm going long here, but bear with me. I'm almost done. We talked about Puna Ford, um, and we talked about Shelby Harris, and we talked about Al Woods. And and when you go look at those guys individually, they didn't seem to be the problem. So is the guy still on the roster part of that problem? I don't know. I I can't. I can't tell you that um, because it's hard. Um, usually when a guy isn't doing his job and, and it, it, it's obvious, but sometimes it's not because sometimes a guy does something like dive into a gap and penetrate. Um, and you, you think that that's what the team is asking him to do, but it wasn't. Um, and it's hard to tell. Um, and maybe it's a situation where um there was too much freelancing going on and not enough um, trust that guys Discipline. are going to do what they're going to do. And yeah. And if that's the case, then maybe there's a reason why Shelby Harris has not been brought back to the team because on the field and watching the tape, it looks like he was the team's best defensive lineman last year. Mm-hmm. Um, You're familiar with Matty Brown, correct? Yeah. So Matty Brown has got a podcast uh, overload podcast and uh, that he shares with a few other people. And he, he does a very good job, in my opinion, on diagnosing uh, and, and talking about the defense. 
and and he's way over my head on terminology. He's like a terminology king when it comes to um, assigning defensive uh, scheme um, terminology, and I'm just mm-hmm. not. I barely understand him half the time, um, but which is a which is a good thing. I'm not I'm not putting him down. I'm complimenting him. Um, and you know, when, when he talked about the three, four, he said, it's not the scheme, it's not the coaching necessarily, but it's also not the players. Cause the, you know, he, he, you know, he talked about the players and run fits and so forth and everyone's kind of good at that. And you go look at the stats and, and the PFF ratings and, and all that kind of stuff. It points to the idea that maybe it was scheme a little bit and, and coaching more than players and I just, and, and then you listen to the, some of the guys they still have on the team and Bobby Wagner and some of the others, they point to more of the, the, the player thing, the trust thing that we just, you know, like you said, we were kind of ad hocing this thing. And, and, um, so it's, it's really, it is hard to know for sure. Mm-hmm. It is. And like I said, there, there are times when th- this team, um, appeared to be two gap or they, they were two gapping and times when it's it felt like they abandoned two gapping completely and went to a one gap defense and you know you make and the half the team got the message and half the team did well yeah you make the assumption that um that is the game plan and and the coaching and that kind of stuff and not players choosing to freelance and um you know, making bad reads and that kind of stuff. So, um, I mean, I think it, I would let just the pervasiveness of it in certain games versus others. I think it's a scheme thing. I just I really do. But, um, yeah, I mean, the, especially the Shelby Harris one, cause he looked like the team's best defensive lineman and the CXF had like no interest in bringing him back. Like he had the asked, fourth highest defensive tackle pressure rate in all of football. Yeah. And, and, and just no interest. And when, when asked about it after the draft, Pete Carroll was like, Oh yeah, we'd love to get, um, you know, Puna and Al back in here. Um, of course they signed like almost immediately with other teams. Um, but they, um, someone asked him about Shelby Harris. He's like, yeah, I guess him too. Um, and that to me was, was really interesting. And, and, you know, when you hear guys like Miles Adams talk, it that that is one of those things where it's like, okay, well, maybe this is a situation where um, a guy was freelancing too much. Yeah, there were times uh, during the season, especially late, where we were actually pretty good at at stopping the run and and forcing teams to be one dimensional. But you got to take that with a grain of salt too, because it really does depend on the offenses Which you're team? facing, the quarterbacks, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So. All right, let's get out of here. Uh, camp's been fun so far. I've got uh, you know a week here coming up. Uh, we talked about last show uh, players that that we want to continue to watch and so forth. Uh, the 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 running back one that you mentioned up front as being one of the most fascinating is I think I agree with you um, with Ken Walker out and Charbonnet out. This gives the opportunity for DJ Dallas McIntosh and some of the other younger guys that we don't even really, we have no idea name recognition wise what what they're up to. That gives them an opportunity as well to get reps in, uh, which is which is a good thing. Uh, we already know Char- uh, Charbonnet is going to be a, a good fit, and, and I've heard good things about him, hard worker, all that kind of stuff. And we know what Walker can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this the wide receiver thing is just crazy. It's like. I don't even know, like some of the undrafted rookie free agent guys, like how, why they even signed with, with Seattle. Um, but like Matt Landers, I think has got a real shot. I've heard good, good things about him over, over like guys like Cody Thompson, K Johnson. I know they like K Johnson a lot. Uh, Jake Bobo, uh, guys like that. So those are interesting ones for me. Any, any other players that stand out for you that you will really want to take a look at this year or this week? And, and oh, if I'm, it's important for watching, them to kind of show. I'm going to be watching Vi Jones very closely um, because he's a, he, this is a guy who is, his athleticism and his speed and his ability to do those things. And he bulked up a little bit because they're trying to get him committed to a single position instead of um, being that guy who's, you know, a, a linebacker, jack of all trades <laughs> yeah, with, right. um, with, you know, no, but no real position. Um, and if he settles in as 
that middle linebacker, which is, like I said, he changed his body to, to be that, he has a chance to be really good. And um, I'm going to continue to watch Because his instincts are off the, off, the, off the chain. I mean, do you really? I, I think, yeah, I think he looks outstanding. I am more and more intrigued about him beating out Devin Bush and, and taking over that spot. Um, we talked about that last show. I thought it and, could be a potentially viable situation just given that the buzz that we're hearing about him. Yeah. So I'm going to be watching him really closely. Um, and then the other one is going to be Witherspoon. I want to see him, um, you know, get in and now that the pads are on and, and he can start to show what he does and, and all of that, because he's got to beat out Mike Jackson if he wants to be a starter and Jackson is given him no room. Um, there's no opening there, right? So he's got to create an opening with his play. Um, and uh, I am excited to see him, you know, grow and develop now that he's on the field. There's three players that I want to see uh, turn it on this week, uh, and they play the exact same position. Boye Mafe, Tyreek Smith, and Derek Hall. Yeah. Um, I want to see what we've got there. Now, by all indications, Boye Mafe is uh, right where he was last year, and that's good news for the Seahawks. He's going to get some opportunities. But we've been hearing about Tariq Smith in the offseason. Haven't yet heard any updates or news or standout plays uh, here in training camp so far. I need him to kind of step it up. He's got an opportunity, really, to, to be a part of a rotation and, um, and, and earn a spot on this roster, and he needs to be careful. To, to to go out there and, and, and show what he's got because his his job is not guaranteed. I think that the team would hold on to him just for the upside, and he's second year. But if he really wants to be part of the defense, let's, let's see what you got, kid. Let's see it. I haven't heard anything about Derek Hall out there, about standout plays or um, any of that. He just seems to be flying under the radar, and that is – uh, disappointing, really, given a guy that was such a high pick and, and the team talked about, yeah, sure, he was taken in round two, but he was the last of the first round grades still on their board, so they were super excited for him. That's why they didn't try and trade out of the spot. And and so far, it's kind of like he's going through the motions, and, and um, that's got me a little worried. Yeah. Well, another guy I haven't heard about at all is Cameron Young. Um, that's true. Which is, uh, yeah, okay, he plays in a spot that you're not going to get a lot of headlines, but, but true. Especially, but Especially not in, on non-pad, non-pad practices. So Right, right. All right, let's get out of here. I you know, I said we were going to get out of here like 15 minutes ago. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thanks for holding on, though, if you did. Uh, you can find Keith at uh, Myers NFL on Twitter. You can find me at uh, NW Seahawk. You can find the show, Seahawks Playbook Podcast, on any podcast platform. Just search and hit that subscribe button, and then on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you're watching us already, make sure you hit the subscribe button or you're already subscribed. And uh, that way, every show that we drop, we're going to do you know two, potentially three a week, uh, all through uh, the season, um, all year, really. Uh, and just make sure those are in your feed and you don't miss us any uh, anytime a new show pops. So that's great. Until then, go Hawks. Go Hawks. Seahawks Playbook Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Bill is at NW Seahawk, Keith is at Myers NFL, and the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.